We did something to the screen, so what do I do? Slideshow? Yeah. Oh, presenter tools. Present tool. Hey, there you go. Okay, that's the first and last technical glitch of the evening. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out on this cold night, and thank you very, very much indeed to the New York Studio School, not only for uh, hosting this uh, lecture, but also for dealing with all the uh, the inconvenience and rigmarole of having to reschedule the lecture. When when it was uh, originally scheduled, uh, uh, I was in London, and Fran O'Neill asked me if this date would work, October the 20th, I think it was, and I said, ah, nothing in my calendar? Yes, that sounds good. And then uh, an Israeli friend of mine, who's uh, as secular as they come, said, uh, phoned me up and said, David, you know, I, I was just putting your lecture in, in my calendar, and you seem to be talking about Kitai and Walter Benjamin or Kol Nidre. That's, well, immediately I thought of that great quote from Franz Kafka, I have never made a frank deposit in the bank of belief. And this indeed is a painting by uh, Kitai entitled Kafka's Hat, 2003 to 4, which reminds me of the bowler hats that uh, old-fashioned gentlemen used to wear to synagogue on the high holy days when I was growing up, and when I did know what day of the year Yom Kippur was falling on. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good image with which to get going. Actually, Kitai quoted that statement of Kafka's in a lecture he gave in 1983 at the synagogue in Oxford. He said, the phenomenal history of anti-Semitism tantalizes me more than a faith I never knew. My art has turned in the shadow of our infernal history. You'll be able to see the titles as we go through the lecture at the bottom, so I don't need to announce each one. Um, can everyone read that? No. No. OK. <laughs> You'll see a little uh, few ants crawling at the bottom of the screen, so I'll announce what the paintings are. Excellent. That adds, that adds, hmm, probably seven and a half minutes to the lecture, for which I apologize in advance. This is Eclipse of, Eclipse of God after the Uccello panel called Breaking Down the Jew's Door, 1997 to 2000. Um, and a, a typical, um, well, not a typical, but um, like most of the mature works of Kitai, it's a, it's a painting, an image of his, which is at the same time a transcription of an existing image, like many of them, uh, a work in the National Gallery in London. Um, and it's, it's um, an image that has poignancy for him uh, because it deals with uh, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism. So tonight's talk is about Walter Benjamin and Arby Kitai. You know, in the first sentence of uh, Hannah Arendt, this painting is called Hannah Arendt in Jerusalem, 2006. It's a small panel of about 14 by 11 inches. The opening sentence, as many of us I'm sure know, of uh, her, her great essay from the, uh, from the 1960s, on Benjamin, published in the New Yorker and then serving as the introduction in the, uh, in the edition of Illuminations, a selection of Benjamin's writings. She says, uh, Fema, that much coveted goddess, has many faces. And she then goes on to talk about the perils of being a posthumous discovery, somebody essentially uh, a private person and from a career perspective a failure in his own life who becomes uh, a cult figure posthumously. Um, and when I've been telling people that I'm lecturing on Kitai and Benjamin, I've almost had the sensation that in terms of reputation, um, they, could be, they could be ships crossing in the night. Because, um, as I say, whereas, whereas Benjamin, um, for a variety of reasons we can get into, enjoyed no career success in his life, virtually published just very little work, and um, uh, um, had to wait till his uh, disciples and his uh, peers um, 
succeeded in making something of his great and voluminous writings after he was gone and after uh, the world returned to a modicum of civilized behavior. Um, Kitai was discovering uh, Benjamin uh, before the flood, before the deluge, as he put it, uh, because Benjamin became, as I say, this cult celebrity figure in the 1960s uh, with the, the countercultural movement and uh, uh, the student movement and the sort of new leftist activity in the late 60s, a lot of excitement surrounding uh, Benjamin as an alternative to uh, mainstream Marxism and his more oddball kind of uh, personal Marxist perspective, one also uh, that was passionately concerned with uh, what has become media studies, so this sort of inadvertently very trendy figure. Kitai, before, the, before the, ma the, the masses, as it were, Kitai discovered him in the journal of the Leo Beck um, uh, annual survey, uh, a little essay by Gershom Scholem, who was uh, Benjamin's closest friend and one of his great champions. Um, uh, uh, at the time that uh, Kitai made that discovery, he was uh, the it generation uh, personified. Uh, he was the, one of the leading personalities uh, at the Royal College of Art, a generation that included um, David Hockney and other stellar, um, uh, soon to be recognized as pop artists in, in Britain, including uh, Alan Jones and uh, uh, Derek Beauchamp and uh, Patrick Caulfield. And uh, Kitai, although he never signed up as a pop artist, his concerns were way too cerebral and highbrow ever to really make sense of the essentially populist and uh, uh, commercial and uh, mass media oriented uh, pop art movement, uh, we'll see that his uh, reliance on uh, appropriated imagery, uh, his sometimes uh, hard-edged kind of illustrational uh, technique, and um, also his infatuation with the movies uh, does make sense in relation to pop art. And he was um, a major, I, I think, instigator, um, not of the pop art movement, but of the some of the individual talents, such as Hockney, with whom he's pictured here. Um, and so one can imagine he's discovering he's discovering Benjamin a, a few years before Benjamin's meteoric post posthumous um, uh, ascendancy, at a, at probably in 1965, the very year that his uh, painting the previous year, The Ohio Gang, um, this uh, six foot square uh, canvas doesn't look square on, for some reason, but apparently it is, um, uh, entered the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, what's happened subsequently, I get the sense, is that um, you know, Kitai's had a, a highly controversial career. Uh, he's somebody who goes through periods, of the radically different periods and styles. Um, and many people don't like him in any of his periods. Some people uh, are infatuated uh, uh, by his, uh, say, his 80s works um, and think that his 60s works are arcane and a bit pretentious and uh, a little bit, you know, um, of their time, whatever. And then there are people who think he was very exciting in the 60s and went off the rails. And then there are people who think the 60s and the 80s were fine, but he went mad in the 90s. So um, whatever your reason for having your doubts, uh, Kitai is a problematic figure, uh, which is entirely suitable for a figure, for a person who's centrally concerned with problematics. Um, but that doesn't make it any less problematic for him. Uh, so um, uh, I am a, a diehard um, Kitaiist, um, and I find the work of all periods uh, equally um, galvanizing. Um, and am able to find the personality behind the works um, frequently uh, infuriating. And I can perfectly well see why others, for, for others, he's just too much to take. But 
talking therefore, talking about among very young people, so I'm talking about Kitai and Walter Benjamin, they say, oh, Walter Benjamin, and who's Kitai? Or, um, uh, so uh, there's some work to be done among Kitaiists to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this amazing legacy is, uh, is passed on. But for the moment, I think it's fair to say it's a contested legacy. So it is ironic that where, where Kitai thought Benjamin became something of an alter ego, as we're going to discover for Kitai, especially in his early period. And it's ironic that for Kitai, this ascendant star, part of the appeal of Benjamin was his obscurity, his being forgotten, his being an overlooked figure. And um, in a way, you could say he's helped, uh, well, Benjamin didn't really need Kitai, but Kitai did his bit to immortalize uh, Benjamin by making use of his work and his image. Um, but as I say, there's the element of ships crossing in the night. Who's he? No, he's not Walter Benjamin. Uh, this is uh, Sibelius. <laughs> kind of thing Walter Benjamin might do, or R.B. Kitai, uh, appropriate an image that seems to have nothing to do with what we're talking about, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, shocking you into um, having to rethink things intellectually and visually. It's uh, what uh, Benjamin calls agitational usage, and there's a, a, a concept that particularly endeared him to the young collage montage oriented uh, artists influenced by surrealism uh, and iconology and uh, Walter Benjamin. But why is Sibelius here? Well, uh, a young composer was once complaining to Sibelius about some terrible reviews that he'd received and uh, saying the critics said this and the critics said that and the critics said the other. And Sibelius, apparently a rather taciturn man, just sat and listened to it all, and then he said, well, tell me, in what European city is there a statue of a critic? <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer is now Port Bou in Spain, where, <laughs> where Danny Caravan, the Israeli uh, uh, sculptor, uh, uh, artist of outdoor installations and, and monuments, is primarily known for his sort of uh, innovative work in war memorials, um, um, uh, has made this work, uh, uh, Passages, monument to Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, uh, Porbu, Spain, and it was made from 1990 to 94, and sort of Richard Serra-like staircase abutting into the bay there. Um, Port Blue is the town on the, in Spain on the border with France where in uh, September 1940, after, after months of being harassed and uh, trying to escape the Gestapo and trying to get his papers in order so that he could emigrate to uh, America, uh, uh, Benjamin, who actually was a somewhat suicidal personality anyway, had been planning and trying suicide for some decade or so. Um, finally did take his own life. Uh, alas, entirely unnecessarily, the next day he could have, uh, the, the party he was with and had crossed the Pyrenees with uh, were indeed able to get through and go their merry way. So as somebody has pointed out, Benjamin could have got to America, got tenure, and been forgotten in the 50s. Instead, he took his own life, died in Spain, and is now one of the great stars of 20th century cultural commentary. So uh, Danny Caravan has provided a memorial to uh, Walter Benjamin, but I would suggest that the memorial, really, is this amazing painting from the early 1970s, the autumn of central Paris after Walter Benjamin. And it's by R.B. Kitai. And later on, we're going to look at it, hopefully, in a little bit of illuminating detail. But for the moment, just put it there for you to savor, if you're not familiar with it yet. It's ironic uh, that uh, 
I'll try and not use the word ironic a little less often. Um, it's a paradox that Kitai uh, should have immortalized not just one, but several critics and commentators and scholars in his work. Uh, when uh, he may end up being best known as an artist who was taken down and taken out by the critics and then hit back um, uh, very famously in the uh, aftermath of his long-awaited retrospective exhibition at the Tate Gallery in London in the early 90s, which traveled to the Metropolitan Museum and the LA County Museum. Uh, his life's work was uh, uh, laid into, uh, in no uncertain terms, in a rather ad hominem attack by four or five um, uh, London critics who spared no mercy in, in, in dealing with this work. And this uh, precipitated um, Kitai's eventual departure from London. And tragically, during that period of uh, uh, turbulence, uh, perhaps related to that or not, uh, his wife, Sandra Fisher, who we showed at the school a couple of years ago, uh, passed away, died of an aneurysm, which, which death he blamed on his critics. So um, Kitai, yes, it makes sense that Kitai would, would make art about critics. This is a work called Arcades after Walter Benjamin. Uh, Walter Benjamin's great magnum opus, which he, he brought nowhere near to fruition, uh, but worked on for, for over a decade, uh, and was the raison d'etre of his being in Paris, was a work on uh, the 19th century, on capitalism and the capital city. Uh, his uh, Persagenwerk, his uh, arcades project, and so you get lots of arcades popping up in anything to do with Benjamin, including memorials like Passages by Danny Caravan and Arcades after Walter Benjamin by Kitai, which I have not seen in the flesh. This is a zero. This is a scan of a. Uh, this is a scan from a book in black and white of this painting, the second Benjamin direct. Uh, Benjamin painting of the uh, early 1970s. Um, Kitai, as I've already intimated, uh, a, a very bookish artist. Uh, one artist said of him, Tom Phillips, that with his first exhibition at the Marlborough Gallery in 1963, uh, single-handed, he brought the intellect back into British art. Um, he's uh, somebody who once said, the books are for me what trees are for landscape painters. Um, he's uh, never shy to quote and to cite a name and um, uh, to pin any reference to what he's doing. And he's also, in a way, somebody who brings his own commentary to bear on his own work in the form of uh, prefaces, in the sense of Henry James's prefaces to his novels, which he's often written, very beautifully worded in a way. Um, some people rate Kitai almost as seriously as a writer, as a painter, although obviously an art writer, uh, writing about his intentions, his fantasies, and his preoccupations. So um, he himself was immersed in what you could call a higher criticism. And he made several paintings and images that have to do with critics and criticism. This is, uh, Walt, this is Walter Lippmann of 1966, Walter Lippmann, great American political commentator of the uh, mid 20th century. The painting seems to have remarkably little to do with Lippmann and a lot to do with two of Kitai's great personal obsessions, movies and prostitutes. But um, Nonetheless, it bears the, the title Walter Lippmann, and so uh, there's another critic for you. Uh, this is an image, called, this is the cover, I believe, for a day book by Robert Creeley. Uh, second, I'd say that Kitai's only serious rivals as the poet among painters 
uh, sorry, the painter among poets, I'm knowingly inverting the uh, description of Frank O'Hara as the poet among painters. Kitai is probably uh, his only rivals for being the, the poet, the, the painter among poets uh, would, would be either Picasso or Alex Katz. Um, he's collaborated with, made portraits of countless uh, poets and used many, many uh, uh, titles derived from poetry in, in his uh, works. Um, notice that, however, on the very bottom there, can you see the volume that uh, is being read by this um, rather fuzzy character is um, I.A. Richards. And I.A. Richards was a great uh, British-born um, critic, sort of one of the precursors of the new criticism uh, in the 1960s. Um, but as I've as I've said already, the 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 way we would really expect to remember Kitai is not as a memorializer or a, a hagiographer of critics, but as uh, somebody ready and willing to stand up to them. Uh, this painting, which you can all see, of course, is a transcription or a transposition of, of Bellows' um, uh, uh, Dempsey versus Furpo, which is in the uh, Whitney Museum, uh, I think. Is it? Yes. Uh, and he's uh, recast it as Whistler versus Ruskin, novella in Terry Verti, Ter Verti, Ter Vert, yellow and red from 1992. It's a five foot square canvas. And there you can see it is square, um, unlike that other square canvas we're looking at. Um, Kitai is cast himself, if you look on the right, as the referee. Um, uh, Whistler has just dealt a blow to Ruskin, who falls out the ring there, uh, cascading upside down in a, in a pose that is, in fact, a transcription of uh, uh, Rembrandt's Descent from the Cross, which itself was a transcription of a Rubens' Descent from the Cross. So all very transcribed. But um, the historically significant thing about um, Furpo, of course, is that although he was so spectacularly not from the ring, he got up and went on to win the match. So uh, we could ask who really wins this battle between art and criticism. Yeah, of course, the reason it's Whistler and Ruskin is because Whistler famously sued Ruskin for uh, that derogatory review in which he described his work or said of the dealer showing his uh, work that it was as if uh, somebody had flung a pot of paint in the face of the public. Um, uh, Whistler sued and he was awarded the grand sum of one shilling in Dam one farthing in damages. One farthing is even less than a shilling. Uh, Whistler then went broke, and Ruskin then went mad. So it wasn't a wasn't a very happy fight. Now you could say, uh, in a way, okay, uh, Kitai will have some some significant tribal affinities with uh, Whistler, being an American in London. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio in Troy and came to uh, Europe on the GI Bill, studied in Vienna um, and Paris a little, and uh, Oxford before Oxford, where he, of course, studied at the Ruskin School of Drawing. So that might put him on Ruskin's side rather than Whistler's. Uh, he, you would think, would be on Whistler's side uh, because uh, um, Whistler's a painter and his work has been savaged by a critic. Um, but on the other hand, Whistler is the great sort of father figure of formalism in a way, or at least uh, at least the midwife of formalism, um, in in that you know he would call his a portrait of his mother, the sort of symphony in grey, and uh, rather in um, homage to that or poking fun at that, Kitai subtitles the painting novella in tervert, yellow and red, um, but uh, really uh, Kitai's life and work is is really much more with Ruskin in that it's uh, uh, an art where he, Kitai famously said, uh, art is not my life, life is my life. Uh, and he's, uh, Rus uh, Kitai is an artist not afraid to tell stories, uh, not afraid uh, of content. Uh, so that's why I think he's a referee. He could support either character in this jostle. But by the time he comes to paint, the killer critic assassinated by his widower, even, in 1997. <laughs> Title, of course, um, paying homage to uh, Duchamp. Um, 
There's, uh, whereas the transcription within the painting is more Manet, as in the execution of Maximilian, um, this, this, this very angry painting, uh, the, the, the critic is uh, a monstrous, ugly, spewing character uh, there with many eyes, but uh, uh, not eyes that are good enough for, for great paintings of, like kit eyes. And the, um, the executioner there has a, a letter kuf from the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter K uh, in Hebrew, uh, perhaps signifying uh, Kitai himself. Uh, it actually says on the uh, handle of the rifle, uh, vindic, uh, vindicated, uh, which I'm noticing for the first time. So there's a great advantage to um, PowerPoint displays where the painting is several times, the, the image is several times bigger than the painting, uh, or certainly many times bigger than the reproduction from which it was scanned. Uh, might be a good moment to thank the scanner who's with us this evening, my trusted assistant, Gabby Grodin. Um, how are we doing? Yes. So, um, this is the installation of that painting. He's a Royal Academician in London, very fond of the Royal Academy. When he left London in, in disgust, painting a painting, in fact, called The Last of England, in emulation of that pre-Raphaelite painting of that title, to signify his um, shaking the sand from his boots, so to speak. Um, as a Royal Academician, he's entitled to put in whatever he wants to the summer exhibition. So he put in a display and, in fact, was given a room to curate of various of his friends. Um, and uh, he made this rather unusual uh, montage of paintings. Uh, montage is the wrong word, perhaps. What, it, what is the right word when you make one work out of many works? An installation, I guess, would be the work. The, type, the, the word, and as this is a Duchampian uh, title, in, he might as well live with the word installation to describe uh, the placement of this work and various other documents and the Manet print of the execution, which you can see to the left of the painting. So, Kitai and Benjamin. So for Kitai, the, the, this German literary critic, uh, cultural theorist, uh, was the exemplary diasporist. In 1989, he published a book called The First Diasporist Manifesto, which crystallized his uh, obsession of some years standing with uh, issues of Jewishness, uh, which came as a surprise to some of his uh, friends uh, who knew him as uh, a cultured literary uh, painter and man about town or whatever, recluse, whichever, uh, but didn't know him as a Jew. I mean, knew that his paintings were primarily concerned with the history of the left and socialism and high culture. Um, so when he started painting paintings about the Holocaust, and telling everyone that his, and, and, and taking a quote from uh, Arnold Schoenberg, who said Schoenberg had converted to Christianity uh, early in his career. Uh, 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 but uh, with the rise of the National Socialists, uh, reaffirmed and reconnected with his Judaism and, and uh, made the statement that uh, uh, my, my, Jew my Jewishness is more important to me than my music. And this, this phrase was served as the epigraph. There are always very poignant epigraphs in any text by Kitai. Served as the epigraph to his uh, uh, exhibition at the Marlborough Gallery in London of uh, these, these uh, passion paintings dealing with the Holocaust. So Benjamin, he singles out as the exemplary diasporist. Um, and um, he makes a statement about, much later, about his, uh, his interest in, in Benjamin and others. He says, almost 30 years ago, excuse me. Almost 30 years ago, under the spell of diasporists like A.B. Warburg, Fritz Saxel, Edgar Wint, and the Surrealists, I made a little painting called His Cult of the Fragment. This is not that painting. This is Kent Studas Land, but it's from the same uh, period. Um, 
I was, frag I was a fragmented cultist 10 years before I discovered Walter Benjamin, 1892 to 1940, the exemplary and perhaps ultimate diasporist and his cult of the fragment. It would be 15 years before I ever heard the term Midrash and became transfixed by the artful and highly diasporist history of that very real exegetical tradition within Jewish history. 30 years later, I've learned of the diasporists of the Ecole de Yale and their craze and fascinating cult of the fragment based on their French and diasporist mentor. Things sure do only connect. Uh, it's good that you get a flavor of his way of writing and thinking and um, citing and connecting. Um, uh, it's a very bombastic um, uh, prose style, for sure. It might need a little exegesis from me, although I won't offer a midrash. Midrash, by the way, is um, a term within a Jewish, uh, within rabbinic um, uh, Judaism uh, that uh, describes a uh, telling a story that provides um, uh, amplification or emendation uh, of, uh, of the sacred text. Um, actually, uh, telling the story is superfluous to that definition. Uh, I was thinking of something else called Agadah. So Midrash is just providing the uh, the gloss, the interpretation to, to explain, often in rabbinic Judaism very playfully, and sometimes even one could say subversively, the, the true kind of theological or theosophical or uh, whatever meaning of, of a biblical story. So uh, um, I won't provide a midrash, but I will provide a little exegesis and just tell you who some of the people are in that rather cryptic statement. Um, A.B. Warburg is the founder of uh, uh, what became, actually he was a, uh, a, a theorist and a scholar, rather similar in a way to uh, Benjamin, uh, uh, who was a pioneering of a, uh, a way of, uh, an approach to art history or cultural history, uh, which came to be called iconology, and uh, Panofsky, Gombrich, and people were, were the great sort of disciples of, of, of that way of doing things. Um, as a study of the Renaissance, as a kind of total, a total study that brings in, um, it isn't just a, it, it, it departs from being a stylistic history of, of the arts to being instead something that really finds the underlying um, unexpected connections between things. Um, particularly through the study of iconography. Uh, so uh, Edgar Vint is, is a, a man who taught uh, at Oxford, and uh, Kitai was very influenced by uh, uh, studies with him while he was at the Ruskin. A marvelous book called uh, 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 Anarchy and Order by, is Anarchy and Order or Art? No, Art and Anarchy. Art and Anarchy by Vint, which I strongly recommend. Uh, Obviously, some years since I read it myself, but nonetheless, do do read it yourself. Um, so, um, so then Benjamin, who we're talking about now, uh, when he talks about the uh, uh, diasporus of the Ecole de Yale, he means, I think, uh, Harold Bloom primarily, but also maybe someone like Richard Rorty, uh, and the, uh, uh, the the French and diasporus mentor, of course, is Derrida. So he's um, making uh, some interesting connections, some, some perhaps slightly off-the-wall connections in a way, uh, between very diverse uh, people, surrealists like uh, Andre Breton with his theory, theory uh, the iconologists, Walter Benjamin, the sort of uh, independent thinker, Marxist, whatever, uh, rabbinic Judaism, deconstruction. Uh, this, by the way, is a painting called If Not Not from 75 to 6, uh, Five Foot Square, which uh, uh, deals, although when first seen and received, people didn't pick up on it and realize it, it was his first uh, kind of intimation of a, his uh, uh, 
deeply um, uh, passionate uh, obsession with the Holocaust. It's actually a painting that's about T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Uh, you know that great line in Eliot, these fragments that are shored against my ruin. So Eliot, Pound, are really the avatars of uh, uh, Kitai, the young American in, in London, and Kitai, the artist in the 60s, who's not yet seemingly into Jewishness as his theme. And this painting is, is seen as uh, a painting about the wasteland, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And those of you who have ever been to the British Library may know that a very large tapestry has been made um, of, of after this painting and that hangs in the, uh, in the, in the lobby of the uh, British Library. It's a very significant public work in Britain. Um, won't go into any exegesis of this painting other than to say the gatehouse at the top is, is that of Auschwitz. Um, but the validity of the connections that uh, Kitai makes between these various people who turned him on to fragmentation and what you can do with fragments and what you can do with making uh, connections between those fragments uh, uh, has, has, as I say, some validity, uh, considerable validity. Um, actually, uh, Benjamin uh, did frequent the circles of uh, A.B. Warburg in Hamburg in the 1920s. Uh, this image is of uh, the uh, Warburg Library in uh, uh, Hamburg, which uh, with the advent of the Second World War was transported to, uh, to London, uh, where it's now now the Warburg, as opposed to the Warburg, and that's what happens when you cross the channel, and uh, is the greatest library in the world of uh, uh, deal, dealing with the Renaissance and with occultism and uh, uh, consciousness and various other subjects. Um, so those connections are indeed valid between, between iconology, surrealism, deconstruction, and Walter Benjamin with his arcades project. Um, and I think Kitai is also correct, if we can leave Midrash and iconology and go back to a stylistic way of looking at an artist and his work, if we, if we look at Kitai's work of the 1960s, we see uh, uh, that he indeed he's, has a point in, in thinking of himself uh, in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, uh, those fragmentists and of, of his being in a way proto uh, Benjaminian of his being uh, ready for Benjamin when he discovered him. This is uh, a work called um, Reflections on Violence from 1962 uh, and typical of the work of that period. Uh, it seems to be a very uh, scatological uh, uh, array or disarray of uh, found sources and doodles and um, uh, small isolated imagery. Um, uh, this is a Good God, Where is the King or Where is Count Haydick from 1963, a screen print. Screen printing uh, provided Kitai with a technical means to really advance the whole uh, uh, agitational usage of, of found um, source materials and, and texts as well, um, making imagery from text in this work. The image on the top left-hand corner, by the way, is Marcel Proust on his deathbed. We'll see a lot of, we'll see more of Proust and we'll see more of deathbeds. Um, um, so the points of affinity in Kitai's early collage work in the 60s with Benjamin, besides this whole thing of agitational usage, the, the sense that citations can uh, uh, stand on their own and actually subvert rather than emphasize uh, the point of a text. That's, that was considered one of the startling innovations of, of, of Benjamin's way of writing, that he would find texts um, that would stand on their own, would sometimes even be in a dialectical relationship with the argument that he was making, sort of being, in a, word, in a way, anti-epigraphs. Uh, Benjamin was very proud of the fact that his work on uh, the German Baroque uh, uh, was almost made up entirely of quotations and had almost no interlinking text. It would be a rather unusual way to get a doctoral dissertation published in the 1920s uh, or indeed today, uh, but uh, that's, that was his achievement and that was his pride. Um, 
the phrase pearl diving comes up in Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, essay on, on Benjamin and is, is, a, is, a, is a subheading that Kitai himself uh, used in one of his own most influential texts, the introduction to the catalogue of an, uh, an exhibition he selected for the Arts Council in Britain called The Human Clay, uh, where he first put forward the idea that there's a school of London uh, and um, also uh, rather radically or uh, subversively in the mid-1970s in the heyday of minimal and conceptual art made the case for uh, drawing in particular from uh, the human figure. Um, but in this early work uh, of Kitai, uh, excuse me, I need to go back for the notes, uh, a fascination in Kitai with uh, handwriting, doodles, caricature, uh, human and social types, which all uh, connects to both Benjamin and, uh, and iconology. Uh, uh, this is called Specimen Musings of a Democrat 1961. Um, and there's a work of 102 by 127 inches. Uh, you can see the index card as a motif in Kitai, and the index card's kind of vital to the whole Benjamin arcade project, this whole sense of scholarship being arranged rather than in a narrative, rather kind of physically or viscerally, scholarship that can be arranged, uh, spread out on a table. I mean, that may be a fanciful way of thinking about Benjamin, whose intentions presumably were to publish texts, and they were. But um, uh, his life's work wasn't uh, so much around text as around found things, cards, references, connections. Um, and in fact, in the most recent work of Kitai, I mean, the last work he made before he died uh, last year, uh, and was, was shown uh, posthumously, um, a lot of the work consists of these very small canvases, about 8 by 10 inches or 10 by 11 by 14 inches, something like that. Um, and I think you get a very nice sense if you look at his very cluttered, but in, in its way orderly, uh, library studio uh, in Los Angeles, where he spent his last decade. Um, the the uh, uh, the the paintings almost operate like book covers or card indexes. Things that, rather than uh, to be framed and placed on a wall for aesthetic contemplation, uh, he actually encouraged visitors to the studio to flip through like this, as if you're looking through a, a, a card catalog uh, to see all these portraits of his various uh, diasporist saints. Books. This is uh, from a series uh, in our time. We'll see quite a few of those. Uh, screen prints made in 1969, uh, made in a very traumatic time in Kitai's life when his uh, first wife had just taken her own life. Uh, and uh, he and his young children were wandering America to get away from a sense of uh, that tragedy. And um, yeah. Just making art from the, the texture, finding the sort of beauty in a way, uh, or projecting some kind of meaning uh, from the array of battered old book covers in his library. Images like that, Bob and Sis. Um, oh, yes, this is, this is to make the point. That's to make the point about agitational usage in a way, rather, rather than the way that uh, uh, Benjamin's texts worked, so, so Kitai and his um, literal appropriation of books um, is um, subverting their meaning, intention, what have you. Um, I mentioned, but this is actually a page of doodles by uh, Erasmus in, from Marginalia of one of his texts, which uh, served as the uh, basis for a first somewhat de Kooning-esque surreal uh, venture of uh, one of the earliest paintings from 1958, Erasmus Variations, but signaling a whole set of interests that later, when he discovered Benjamin, would um, relate to Benjamin, the uh, 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 the doodle, the caricature, uh, the type. 
But as much as the specific ways in which uh, Kitai and Benjamin's interests can be seen to overlap is the way that uh, Benjamin, as well as the art historians that I just cited and various artists and theorists uh, whose work uh, excited Kitai, also um, appealed to him uh, as a personalities in their own right uh, who, Jewish or not, were uh, victims of uh, refugees from uh, the Third Reich. Uh, he writes in the manifesto, uh, their dispersed, dispersed lives have broken mediocre patterns and searched out cosmopolitan treasure. Um, there's also a personal connection. This is a photograph of his stepfather, Dr. Walter, or Walter Kitai, from whom he took his name, uh, and also presumably um, well, not presumably, also uh, uh, sort of connected to the whole experience of uh, the emigre life. Kitai was, Dr. Kitai was a, a refugee from Austria. The name Kitai, by the way, is a, a Russian, the Russian word for China. So it's a very good name for a person who becomes a diasporist as the name, as it were, geographically bounces around the globe. Um, Kitai is, I mean, the, is the cafe is the old name for China, and that's obviously relates to Kitai. Um, but in a funny way, not to make light of other people's tragedy, um, by by taking the GI Bill, by coming to uh, uh, studying in Vienna, being in France, coming to live in England, um, connecting to all these uh, people in a very special way who are uh, dispersed people, including, of course, uh, the painters that he would group together uh, and came to be the, the core members of the School of London, the Freud and Albach, who were child refugees from Germany, Kossoff, whose parents are refugees from Russia, even Francis Bacon, who was uh, an Anglo-Irishman, so um, he's got pushed from one country or chose to move from one country to another. Um, all of these people, uh, so, so what I'm saying is that um, uh, uh, Kitai, self-elected refugee, as it were. Um, not a refugee, of course, the GI Bill is a good way to travel, but um, uh, by moving around, uh, by being an American in Paris, uh, by um, American in London, in the start, in the in the tradition of uh, of uh, Pound and Whistler and Eliot and Wyndham Lewis and others, uh, replicating or mimicking the whole phenomenon of wandering that's most painfully characterised by the refugee experience. So books, as I say, this is a painting called Good News for Incunabulists, uh, one of his early works from 1962. Books are, oh, how does he come in? Oh, yes. <laughs> a humorous moment, hopefully. This is a Benjamin puppet available from the Unemployed Philosophers Guild. Um, we're also making Barack Obama puppets, if you're interested. Um, the wonders of the internet, what, what you learn. Uh, the, I, uh, the reason I put up a rather funny image of Benjamin is to say that the almost tragic comic element of Benjamin working on a grand project that does not come to fruition. Um, you know, Benjamin, Benjamin had these remarkable gifts which were completely accepted by his peers, uh, Gershom Scholem, who I've mentioned his childhood, or his friend from his youth, uh, uh, Bertolt Brecht, uh, Horkheimer, who ran that institute here in New York, um, uh, the great poet Hoffmannsthal in, in Vienna, that many top-notch people totally recognized Benjamin's exceptional, exceptionalness, but just a uh, combination of factors, being uh, uh, rather a man of a well-to-do background who then loses his money, uh, being uh, on the on the fly from the Gestapo, well, not from going to live in Paris at a time during the Depression, then being on the run from the Third Reich, so on and so forth, never got it together. Um, so he's, um, as it were, um, um, a marginal figure, but one that's accepted by his peers as being major. Uh, 
might in a funny way connect with Kittai's own contradictory self-image as both the hermit and the polemicist, uh, as somebody who's something of a loner, uh, uh, who's also the instigator of a school. And he once, in fact, described the School of London as, quote, a herd of loners. D did I get that water in the end, by the way? Uh, oh, yes, thank you. So Kitai, to speed through a little now, um, Kitai and Benjamin, both bibliomanes. This more from the series In Our Time from 1969. Uh, two London painters, Frank Auerbach and Sandra Fischer. More books. Oh, shoot. I think we skipped a few. Yes, okay. Uh, a painting called London, England, The Bathers. His architects who designed his house, library, studio. So bibliomanes for sure. But also, uh, I think a key personality trait that overlaps between Benjamin and Kitai is what one could call a nostalgia for modernity. Uh, an oxymoron, of course. But uh, Benjamin, the great student of the 19th century, his mind almost in the 19th century, not as, um, not as a historical fondness for a past period, but because of his uh, obsessive interest in the 19th century as that sort of engine house of early capitalism, of the alienation of the modern city. So he's dealing with modernity, but yesterday's modernity. And in a similar way, uh, Kitai on his GI Bill studying in Vienna, which he described as being like Carol Reed's third man, well, it was. Um, uh, there's a, a sense of um, uh, being somewhat out of, out of time, of having a kind of romantic sense that life is elsewhere. But the life elsewhere that he's interested in is not, say, uh, a pre-Raphaelite fantasy of the Middle Ages, but it's a modernist notion of the angst and alienation of the modern experience, but the modern experience of yesteryear. Um, in a way, this, uh, that, that kind of contradiction in terms to be both a painter of modern life and lost in a sense of the past um, uh, is something that Kitai will share with one of his great artist heroes, Manet. So I just have some images such as uh, Desk Murder from 1970 to 84. Um, you know, it's a, it's a historic painting. It's dealing with the, the desk where the final, possibly dealing with the desk where the final solution was um, signed and sealed. But, um, or actually, the, no, it's a desk where the Zyklon B was uh, elected to be the uh, weapon of choice, as it were, for the war against the Jews. Um, uh, but besides that, I mean, to initial people seeing this painting, which was finished in 84, but seen earlier in the, in the 70s, uh, it's a mysterious painting. If you're not given the subtext and you, or the, the plot, you were not given the plot, um, then it's, it's a painting about a grubby, but at the same time quite characterful office somewhere in the past. Uh, this, this drawing that he worked on obsessively in graphite for many years, the Jew, etc., 76 to 79. Again, it's always this, it's always this interwar period um, when, when his obsession with the Holocaust becomes manifest, it's naturally the period that he should be interested in. But before that, there was a sense of a certain sort of nostalgia, a sort of um, affection for the past. Uh, um, rather as you get in the contemporary painter Duncan Hanna, for instance. Um, so even uh, this love for battered old books, uh, the Partisan Review. So this is a cutting edge review, but from uh, a couple of decades before this work was made. And here's an image which ties together two uh, overlapping uh, areas of Benjamin and Kitai. Um, it's another of these uh, anachronistic uh, images. It sort of has the 
feel of a pulp book cover, um, but uh, and, and a sense of you know the, the clothing of yesteryear. This is from 1975, and people weren't dressing that way in 1975, for better or worse. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, the other the other big interest of Kit Eyes is with uh, a fascination with prostitution, as I've said, which uh, uh, he seems to imply on several occasions that uh, Benjamin had a more than passing scholarly interest in, but I haven't been able to confirm that. If there's any great Benjamin-ist in the audience, perhaps they'd fill me in on the salacious details. But uh, what I do know of is, is Benjamin's interest in prostitution via his fascination with Baudelaire as, uh, as uh, one of the motifs, if you like, of 19th century France and the, and the emergence of uh, the capitalist modern city. But for Kitai, it was not a, such an academic interest. Uh, he, uh, uh, before getting on the GI, before serving in the forces, um, he'd uh, been a merchant marine and um, uh, in particular, run uh, particular had, had sailed, shipped out to the to South America in what was called the Romance Run, in which uh, these merchant vessels would take its its lucky sailors from brothel city to brothel city, and there are various paintings later in Kitai's career of his uh, his first time, his second time, etc. Um, so this this the part of that nostalgia for uh, nostalgia for a, a see me slightly squalid sense of the past, these images, which often have to do with uh, uh, street walkers, uh, uh, Smirana Greek, Nikos from 76 to 77. It's also a portrait of his uh, gay publisher friend, Nikos Stangos of Thames and Hudson, but don't know how he feels in this uh, ambiance. But there's Kitai himself descending the staircase. And this is a painting, again, that I haven't seen, but have scanned from a publication, rather fun one, called Frankfurt Brothel from 1977. Uh, when I was first going to the book fair at Frankfurt, uh, Kitai uh, told me exactly which streets I needed to check out for the uh, uh, red light district. And as I mentioned, the uh, Walter Lippmann, that's, that's what seems to be going on in this, in this scene, which is also from the first movie buffs, the first movie that uh, Ingemar Bergman wrote the uh, script for. I uh, can't remember the title, but that's from that. Okay, so um, I'm one of those people who believes very strictly in the psychoanalytic hour when it comes to lectures. But I see that, unfortunately, we're running over it already. So um, I'm going to quicken the pace and at the same time apologize for perhaps keeping you longer with these two eccentrics than you might have wanted to spend this evening. Uh, we've come, as it were, now to the, to the, to the monumental painting of uh, uh, the autumn of central Paris, art of Walter Benjamin, 1972 to 3. As Kitai points out, one of his critics immediately pointed out that the title is not from Benjamin, but from some other sociological text. Um, but that doesn't seem to mind or bother uh, Kitai too much. Um, this, I guess if you can't read the title, you probably can't read the even smaller letters that I spent a good 15 minutes with Acrobat getting there for your delectation. But uh, such is the trials and tribulations of the, the modern art historian. Um, he, one of the things that did, failed to endear Kitai to the critical profession, some members of it at least, is that he, early on, broke a certain taboo in which you know, Matisse has this notion, if you're an artist, the first thing you need to do is cut out your tongue. Uh, well, the first thing Kitai had to do as an artist was write a text about the painting he made and pin it up next to the painting. So that obviously, apart from putting the critic out of business, um, has, has the effect of being, as it were, like the village explainer, of, of over-determining what your image is or means or intends. Um, uh, but uh, um, I, 
at, at one level, one can see the validity of that complaint, but on another, it's so enriching to um, a way into the painting to know that this was the list of Benjamin-esque concerns that Kitai had, and other concerns, not to do with Benjamin, but uh, around and about, that he thought he might broach in the painting. So let me just uh, actually, as you can't read it, read it to you. The diorama, capital letters, uh, for the last time in these dioramas, the worker appeared away from his class as a stage extra and an idol. That's a quote from Benjamin. And it then occurs to him that at the very time that Benjamin was taking his own life in Porbu, uh, uh, he, Kitai, was looking at dioramas in the Cleveland Museum. So he has a note to himself to find out if those dioramas are still around. Uh, cafe life as an autumnal reverie of bourgeois society, nature mort, cafe as an open air interior. And that's a key phrase that uh, the, the sense of the open air interior, that's what really fascinated, what made Benjamin feel so at home in Paris was essentially walking in these streets, these wide, generous boulevards, but you don't feel like you're out exposed in the open. On the contrary, it feels like a one big living room, as it were, because the the facades of the buildings are like interior walls, and um, there's a sense of the the, the, the boulevard as salon. Um, and that's uh, something that uh, uh, open air interior, uh, it's therefore something that he's, Kitai has written in block capitals to be explored. There's the life of the city, uh, the collage implication of B's treatment of the barricade. Uh, B cites barricade metaphors like broken irregular outlines, profiles of strange constructions from Les Miserables, the pile up, the movie posters, smokers, passerby, men about town, uh, etc., the cocotte in her disguises, uh, the, the crowd as refuge, prostitution, fetishism, uh, the proletariat driven out of central Paris, uh, leading to the emergence of a red belt, thus the margins of the picture, man with a hearing aid, police spy, secret agent, the man walking away, B's suicide, the flaneur's last journey, death, quote, to the depths of the unknown to find something new, end quote, from the Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal, Flowers of Evil. Rather than offering, as a, therefore, like a point by my own deconstruction or, or interpretation of the image, I thought I would give the other way around, just to sort of make it a topsy-turvy experience, as it were, an agitational experience, to give you the, the intentions or the, the wish list of the artist in, in the, as a sort of Benjaminian wish list, and then the painting itself. So this open air interior, uh, this is a painting called Where the Railroad Leaves the Sea from 1964. Um, just to say, you know, this way in which uh, frequently in Kitai there's a, uh, uh, an ambiguity exploited between interior and exterior, between flattened and deepened space. Uh, really coming to a head, actually, in, in this one of his seminal paintings, and one that's centrally to do with uh, themes that tie in with uh, Benjamin. Uh, it's called Cecil Court, London WC2, The Refugees, it's from 1983 to 84. Um, uh, won't dwell on it other than to say if, just a few headlines, as it were. Kitai represents himself thrice, uh, reclining uh, in the Corbusian uh, chaise long and thus uh, as a symbol of uh, uh, modernist complacency, perhaps. This is a, a little alleyway in, uh, near, near the Charing Cross Road, and when well, in fact connects the Charing Cross Road and St. Martin's Lane in London's West End, close to the National Gallery. Often when he built the National Gallery, he would buy secondhand books from a refugee uh, German uh, bookseller named Seligman. Um, and uh, so uh, 
it's, it is something like uh, uh, the arcades that so uh, fascinated uh, Benjamin. The arcades in Paris were these uh, glass-covered sort of semi-streets, semi-department stores. Um, uh, basically, you call them in England, you call them a mall, but you wouldn't want to use the word here for, good, for, for uh, whatever happens. But um, <laughs> a mall really is one of the most beautiful and civilized things. It's these, these, these passageways that get the open air uh, feeling, uh, little shops in them. And for, for Benjamin, they were so fascinating uh, because of the. Uh, they were like a collage experience. You have these merchandise thrown at you in these small little sound bites, as it were, these little bits and pieces that don't connect to each other in these compressed spaces and these uh, the space where the, the classes intermingle and at the same time commerce separates them. So for the for the Marxist Baudelarian, the arcades are just an endless source of fascination, and indeed was his endless source of fascination. So London doesn't have too many arcades. It has the Burlington Arcade, which many anyone who's been to the Royal Academy would know, full of luxury cashmere shops these days. Um, uh, but almost an arcade is this sort of funny little space that's pedestrianized, which used to be very rare in London. Uh, it's between two thoroughfare roads. It's, it's created by these two buildings that didn't quite meet. And so then you have this opportunity for commerce. Because they're small shops, they've historically filled with booksellers. So for Kitai, it becomes perfect. It's the, an arcade like Benjamin. There are books, and the bookshops are run by refugees. It, could it get better? Yes, it could, because Kitai then fills it with uh, this sort of mushuga, this mad scene of uh, these figures inspired by Kafka's uh, visits to the Yiddish theater. Kafka, of course, being a great favorite of and subject of study of Walter Benjamin, as well as the man who becomes Kitai's favorite. Um, Art historically, of course, we all know that this paint, the Cecil Court has had its uh, precursor in Balthus's uh, The Street from 1933 in MoMA. Um, the Holocaust was one peak in Kitai's Jewish obsession. Uh, and it's also the point where his Jewishness became manifest to his London friends. And culminating and, and coming out of it was this manifesto and this theory of diasporism. In that painting we were looking at, the uh, Cecil Court, um, Kitai wrote in one of his prefaces that he, he wanted to be able to paint those shop signs uh, following a, a, a distinction made by his, quote, favorite anti-Semite, Ezra Pound. He often likes to call people his favorite anti-Semite. Degas is also another. Um, uh, the distinction between the sign and the symbol. Uh, so. Um, uh, I should have written it down, I forgot to. Uh, Pound says something like uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the symbol uh, exhausts itself, whereas the sign, um, the symbol, which is like a, a focus specific uh, meaning, this is a symbol for that, kind of exhausts itself, whereas the sign has this sort of life in itself uh, and, and therefore can renew itself by coming to mean or symbolize uh, something else, um, which is, in a way, if you think about it, a very Benjamin-esque sense as well. Um, but in a way, Kitai forgot that distinction, very distinction when he came to make the paintings that tried to deal uh, with the Holocaust. Uh, rather heavy-handedly, he sought for a symbol, the equivalent of the cross. He's, he's often obsessed in that Oxford lecture, for instance, with why is there no Jewish art? Why is there no plastic Jewish art? Of course, there are myriad reasons, but um, and debates about it. But he says, you know, his job as a painter, rather rather than theorize as to why there isn't Jewish art, is to make Jewish art. And uh, he, he he notes that it took four centuries for Christianity to come up with the cross as the symbol of Christ's passion, and that he feels a sense of urgency. There isn't four centuries to wait before finding a symbol for the Holocaust and the Shoah. So he chooses the chimney, uh, like the cross, containing the remains in death. 
And so this chimney motif appears, for instance, in this painting called The Jewish Rider from 1984 to 85, its title mimicking uh, Rembrandt's Polish Rider. Uh, the, the, the chimney appears in the corridor uh, running along the right-hand side of the uh, carriage with the Polish cavalryman at one end, and the painting is partly inspired by, uh, the, the sitter, by the way, is the art historian Michael Podro, a late iconologist, you could say, and the, uh, the idyllic countryside outside the window is, is painted in remembrance of the reported uh, phenomenon of uh, somebody actually taking the train ride that was the train ride to Dachau and discovering that the well, the countryside on that train ride was very lyrical and beautiful, and later discovering it was the very country in which Goethe and Eckermann went for their legendary walks. So you have a landscape that's transformed into the worst hell of the 20th century, which is, as it were, comes out of the, the is produced by the nation that also produced one of the highest sort of moments of enlightenment. Come on, PowerPoint. Seems to be slowing down. Okay. Yes, here's another passion, 1940 to 45. Gamania, the tunnel. Um, a personal allegory to do with decrepitude and renewal with himself and his young son and probably his second wife Sandra as this figure ominously entering the tunnel chimney the chimney rather on the right and the tunnel there which is, is this is a typical sort of Kitai painting conflating sources I'm sure most of you recognize the source in uh, Van Gogh's uh, uh, asylum paintings from saint uh, but at the same time, because of their Holocaust connotations, that sense is uh, conflated and confused with uh, the tunnels leading to the gas chambers. A painting called Self-Portrait as a Woman uh, from 1984. Now, with the advent of the Passion series, it became possible to see earlier preoccupations in Kitai's work uh, when, when he was known as somebody who was interested in socialism and highbrow culture uh, and popular culture uh, with no thought of Jewishness or Judaism. Uh, but with the advent of the Passion series, it became possible to see those earlier preoccupations as having Jewish and therefore diasporist uh, implication. Uh, this is one of the In Our Times series showing a, a work of uh, a book by Isaac Babel, who's, uh, who, about whom he made another famous painting. Uh, and this is uh, one of his uh, well known early works, The Murder of Rosa Luxemburg. So, uh, you know, seen at the time and received as a painting about socialist history, uh, re seen. Uh, subsequently to Kitai's development of the 80s as being an early stab at a subject of, of uh, the Jewish modern experience. Um, Kitai's discovered in the Zohar, the Jewish mystical text, uh, 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 a, a sentiment that he very much liked, which is that the book, to the writers of the Zohar, they mean the Torah, of course, uh, but the book uh, changes its meaning every year. And so um, the, de the deconstructionist in Kitai uh, is very excited by that notion that his own paintings can also change their meaning. The Jewish School, Drawing a Golem from 1980. According to uh, Julian Rios, the Spanish poet, Benjamin is the imago that helps Kitai address his own wandering Jewishness, and even more importantly, to give complex and complete artistic existence to it. This, uh, again, typically, again, rather as Van Gogh is the impetus for uh, the uh, tunnel painting, so with drawing the golem, the children here, the kids in the school here, frantically trying to create a golem that can protect them from imminent doom, 
is uh, a reworking of an anti-Semitic caricature, which Kitai discovered in the, the Warburg Institute, uh, by a man named uh, uh, G.E. Opitz, uh, the, the Jewish school, a 19th century sense of the Jews as being inherently disruptive to civilization. But uh, so the picture puzzle and the citation element is one side of Kitai. Uh, another, arguably more conservative and uh, humanist side, and one that uh, possibly makes him uh, a name that's revered in these halls uh, is uh, his personal rediscovery of drawing from life in the mid-1970s. Um, I mentioned earlier the suicide of his first wife. And uh, this didn't overnight change him from being uh, an agitational usage, collage, montage artist to being uh, suddenly a, a humanist drawing whole figures in complete, uh, uh, realistically and uh, completely. Uh, it's a kind of a gradual move and also a gradual uh, reconnection with his own um, earlier education. Uh, but um, What's, I think, rather compelling is, uh, for Kitai is that the, this reconnection with um, a drawing from life and this discovery of Jewishness and or Judaism uh, happened simultaneously. Uh, it was the, the death of his wife, and then it was the encouragement of his, his second wife, Sandra Fisher, to work in pastel uh, that uh, resuscitated his practice of drawing the whole figure. Um, uh, and it's telling that the human clay, a phrase from a, a poem by W. H. Auden, used for that uh, exhibition that brought attention to uh, ongoing interest among a whole cross-section of artists from different styles in Britain who were uh, working from, the, had at some point worked from the figure. Um, the same term he would use, the human clay, to mean his ethnic origins in other texts. Here's one of his pastels, Degas, 1980, his other favorite anti-Semite. Quintin, any of you remember that movie, The Naked Civil Servant? Yeah. This is uh, Quintin Crisp, who was also an artist model in the 70s, earlier, as you may remember from the movie. Marinka Smoking, 1980. <coughs> there. Um, Kitai, in his manifestos, he's written two diasporous manifestos and elsewhere, uh, frequently uh, refers to uh, uh, his Jewish question. Um, now, that might seem, OK, just his funny way of saying things, the Jewish question. Uh, but it's worth stopping and thinking for a moment. Why, why does he call his resurgent interest in his personal identity, his ethnic roots, his ancestral religion, whether or not he chooses to practice it as a faith, it's, it is a faith. So, uh, and, and Judaism is not like Christianity in, that, in the faith sense. In Christianity, you can't really be a Christian atheist. It's kind of a bit difficult. But um, uh, bizarrely, I mean, Judaism makes very, f very infrequent demands of an individual personal declaration of faith in the, in the way that the Christian or, or Christianity or Islam do. It's much more of a, first of all, a collective thing. And second of all, it's about performing commandments rather than um, coming to personal spiritual conclusions. So um, one can, therefore, reconnect with one's Judaism uh, while retaining a modern sense of agnosticism or atheism even. Uh, many, many do. So he could call Judaism Judaism, uh, uh, but he, he, he almost invariably calls it the Jewish question. Uh, and this indeed, uh, this is a recycling of, uh, uh, this is literally the Zohar coming to life and that the, the, the text has changed its meaning because this was originally, as you see, one of his In Our Times uh, works. It's uh, Henry Ford's um, anti-Semitic uh, 
pamphlet, The Jewish Question, from the Dearborn Review, um, which he sort of reworked with these images of Freud, Herzl, Jesus Christ, himself and his son, and Moses uh, in this sort of collage. Um, but the Jewish question, why the Jewish question? And I came across an interesting uh, passage in Hannah Arendt's essay, which is, as we've discovered, so, so crucial for him, um, on, on Benjamin. Uh, today, this question, the Jewish question, Arendt says, today this question has been washed away, as it were, by the catastrophe, catastrophe of European Jewry, in other words, the Holocaust, and is justly forgotten although one still encounters it occasionally in the language of the older generation of German Zionists whose thinking habits derive from the first decades of this century. So um, this is the introduction to Arendt's discussion about the Jewish question as it obsessed uh, Walter Benjamin, Kafka, Karl Kraus, uh, a whole slew of uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, intellectuals of an agnostic bent mostly, um, uh, and is a, is a particularly arcane, in a way, uh, question about Jewish identity. But for Kitai, uh, his passion for Jews doing Jewish pictures Kitai famously said, well, uh, Kitai said uh, uh, rather pertinently for us in New York at the moment, he said, I want to do for Jews what Mirandi did for jars. So in other words, he, he's uh, uh, a, a painter whose obsessions are, uh, he says in an interview, you know, my obsessions for the last 30 years, he's been being interviewed about Cezanne's bathers and why he's so in love with the painting in the National Gallery in London. He said, my obsessions for the last 30 years, he said, I am, a, I am an obsessive personality, and my obsessions for the last 30 years have been uh, the Jewish question, Sandra, and Cezanne's bathers. So, um, uh, uh, it, in a way, goes back to, and this is a painting called The Murano, The Secret Jew from 76 to 7, goes back to this nostalgia for yesteryear, this nostalgia for modernity, that um, his, his, part of his identification with Benjamin and Kafka, uh, to a lesser extent Karl Kraus, but definitely Benjamin and Kafka, and, and also Freud and Proust in a way, and, uh, well, Proust, forget. Uh, um, don't forget Proust, but not, not from this point of view. Uh, Okay, let's stick with Benjamin and, and Kafka. Um, he, by, by appropriating an anachronistic term, the Jewish question, for Judaism, Jewishness, etc., uh, Kitai uh, is doing two things. Number one, it's another instance of anachronism. Uh, um, the, the, the Jewish question as a phrase, I mean, there's a Jewish question to the Nazis, which is, you know, how can we get rid of the Jews? There's, there's a Jewish question to historic anti-Semites, uh, like Wagner, for instance, uh, writing his pamphlet, The Jews and Music, in which he's trying to theorize and explain how the Jew is just incapable of joining, the, the Jew can't join with the folk in, a, in an, an unselfconscious, spontaneous, uh, tapping of the, of the lyricism inherent in German language and, and German folk songs because he's new to these languages uh, and he's speaking them with a foreign accent and he's trying too hard to speak them well and therefore is too self-conscious to be able to be intuitive and creative. That's uh, Wagner's critique. Um, now, to some funny way, to some, some rather bizarre extent, the uh, Jewish intellectuals of the turn of the 20th century internalized some of that um, way of thinking uh, to produce, of course, a more nuanced and sophisticated sense of uh, how it is that, whether it is that Jews can really participate fully in German culture. Um, and uh, there was a man named uh, Moritz Goldstein who went on to be a prominent liberal journalist who wrote an explosive essay called uh, The German Jewish Mount Parnassus, uh, in which he, he, he wrote uh, that we Jews administer the intellectual property of a people which denies us the right and the ability to do so. And uh, many people like 
Martin Buber and uh, Karl Kraus and Walter Benjamin came to the same conclusion and sought outlets either in radical movements like uh, 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 Zionism or communism or else, uh, well, those were the two principal outlets as a way to uh, retain uh, their Jewishness, and Jewishness, as opposed to being a Jew, is, is an invention of this period, um, uh, 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 as an alternative to just muddling along in the way that assimilated bourgeois Jewish civilization was supposed to be doing in, uh, in sort of trying to be nice Germans and Jews at the same time. So, uh, Kafka, uh, Kafka then says, uh, talks about writing in German as being his central uh, kind of existential angst in a way, because, uh, and he realized that he was writing a very fine German. Uh, and um, indeed, Hannah Arendt asks, you know, of course, Kafka is probably the finest German prose of the 20th century. And yet even Kafka is saying that, that his writing in German is, quote, a usurpation of alien property. Uh, and talks about the impossibility of writing differently, other than in German, that is. Um, and, and Walter Benjamin, it's been suggested, uh, adopted this exquisite prose. I mean, his, his German is also considered very, very, I'm not a Germanist, unfortunately, but his German is considered uh, really beautiful and exceptional by, by many uh, who read him, but it's a very self-consciously, deliberately, very, very high academic, uh, scholarly, almost scientific German that he, he writes. Very, very rarely a kind of sp uh, vernacular, or, or uh, uh, when I say vernacular, I don't mean dialect German, but I mean, very rarely does it sort of tap pop culture, or despite his being the, 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 the god of the media studies generation, Benjamin's actual prose, where they're reading in German, they would realize is thoroughly uninflected by um, uh, pop culture. It's, it's, a, it's a rarefied hothouse German. Uh, and it's kind of telling in that, in, in respect of these ideas about an alienation from language, that uh, uh, Kitai should say to one of his interviewers that uh, Western painting tradition from the caves to now is my host language. So, you know, it's, I'm a wandering Jew, I should be speaking Yiddish, but here I am, and there's German. Uh, so, I'm a wandering non-painter, I've discovered I'm a Jew, Jews don't make plastic art, I want to make plastic art. My host language is the visual culture from the caves, through Rembrandt, through Cezanne, through, through Lucien Freud, who somehow or another is painting, God bless him. So. Uh, um, it's therefore very, it's therefore, I'm going to use the word, ironic. It's therefore ironic, or perhaps it's paradoxical, that uh, Kitai is so associated institutionally and because he gave it the name with, with the School of London. And his, his sort of dearest, closest friends are, uh, are Freud and Auerbach. These are the artists he looks up to, and, and Hockney. But Freud and Auerbach, he really looks up to, especially Auerbach. And um, for Auerbach, the whole, the whole of his life in painting is about authenticity. It's, it's, uh, he's, he's sort of internalized Cezanne's doubt. You know, Cezanne scraped down the canvases until he, or whatever he did, it took 150 goes to get a landscape right, it took 100 goes to get a portrait right, as Merleau Ponty recounts. And this set up a whole myth of the authentic artist, somebody who's not interested in just pushing out pictures for the market, but is prepared to destroy his own work to get to that, you know, Giacometti stripping away. Da, 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 da. So that's that whole myth and cult of the authentic, hard-won image, which is so uh, crucial to, say, Frank Auerbach and Leon Kossoff. In their early work, they would accrete the canvas till they became almost like bar-reliefs. And then later on, they found a way to, instead of, if the painting didn't work, uh, a la prima in the first sitting, they would be scraped down. So it had to be spontaneous, and it had to be authentic. Now, this couldn't be. Uh, 
this couldn't be more different from the modus operandi, as you've seen yourself, and you haven't, haven't needed to analyze any of Kitai's paintings for you to see the acute self-consciousness, regardless of the style, whether it's in his somewhat expressionistic work, the 80s and 90s, or in his very tight sort of proto-pop work of the 60s, whatever style he's working in, you can see a very tight-assed painter, somebody who's thinking about every brushstroke and it's giving him pause for thought. Uh, you may critique Auerbach and say, come on Auerbach, you're painting this way, it kind of looks like Soutine, it kind of looks like uh, de Kooning, therefore it's a mannerism. So it's possible if you want to, to be critical of Auerbach's modus operandi as ma mannerist, but you could never really, you, he, but you have to concede that Auerbach himself could never intend or allow himself to be a mannerist. He may produce a mannerist look, but to do so, he's doing so because he's so against mannerism in his own practice that he has to strive for this authenticity. So with Kitai, on the contrary, it's almost as if, uh, you know, there is in the authentic look uh, um, an inherent uh, mannerism. And look how different the way in which, I mean, what, what Kitai and Auerbach have in common is that they're both obsessed by the old masters and have this sort of uh, deep need to connect with, uh, with the painting of the past and with tradition. And yet uh, the, the reworking uh, of old masters in these artists couldn't be more different. It's, uh, uh, you look at Auerbach or Kossoff here, um, it is, it is reducing and personalizing the, the sensation of the old master painting, Rubens and the previous pair, Rembrandt and this, uh, internalizing within the, 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 the personal language to arrive at a portrait of that painting in much the same way that they'd arrive at a portrait of a sitter in front of them. Whereas with Kitai, it's a kind of, rad it's, a, it's, a, it's a citation, uh, an appropriation, um, and a kind of talismanic, uh, kind of um, uh, almost a fet making a fetish out of the original image to generate the, the, the new image, the Polish rider, the Jewish rider. Uh, uh, if not not, on the right that we looked at earlier, and its uh, pastoral uh, uh, antecedent in uh, Giorgione's La Tempesta. And as I mentioned, the Van Gogh and uh, the Tunnel, uh, or indeed the Velasquez and baseball. <laughs> and In, in no respect could Kitai's kind of inherent mannerism be more acute than in the way in which uh, the way in which he's attuned to the problematics of painterly language is is nowhere more apparent than in this uh, very curious decision he took just before in the in the period leading up to his Tate Gallery retrospective, which in many ways accounted for the hostility of the critics was not so much they turned against the whole life's work. Uh, because uh, of um, because of um, his most recent work, which had he said he was about to retire from painting, and that uh, this was his old age style. He'd realised it was time for his old age style, or he found himself to be. It wasn't that he found himself to be painting in an old age style. It's that he elected to paint in an old age style. And, uh, you know, people would, even his, his dear friend, uh, Richard Volheim, writing in the catalog essay, sort of said, you know, you, you, you enter an old age style, A, when you're old, and B, just because you do, as it were. I mean, it, it forces itself upon you. You, you realize that life's almost over, you, your market is assured, you're not, you don't worry, I mean, if you're Titian or Monet or whoever you are and you've, you're just really enjoying your swan song years, as it were, you just let rip, you're not so worried about finish, there's a kind of, uh, there's a spontaneity and sloppiness and freedom in the application. So Kitai said, here's my old age style, and it, this, this person, how, how how people could view uh, I mean, the late the, the most the late these, these old age style paintings actually had the same inherent problematic as 
the very early um, almost conceptual uh, painting of the 1960s that we've been looking at, at least as far as uh, people who might have been sympathetic to his project. This is a, a dialogue, this is a few words from a dialogue between two very interesting painters, Victor Willing, uh, who, who's, uh, uh, they're both kind of British realist painters, Victor Willing a little more allegorical. Uh, he's the first husband of, uh, uh, he was the husband and, who died of uh, uh, Paul Arego and uh, uh, an interesting sort of personality on the London scene. And he's talking in the, in the mid 60s with uh, Michael Andrews, uh, who's one of the sort of beloved sort of members of the School of London, uh, Freud and Auerbach, and uh, are very, very close to this guy who passed away, um, and who uh, they helped in a way. They, ins they would often insist that if there was, if the British Council, for instance, wanted to do a show of the School of London, they would say, it's not happening without Mike. So Mike Andrews, in a way, relatively unknown figure internationally, got put in these, these interesting exhibitions with Kitai and Auerbach and Freud, School of London type exhibitions. So uh, here they, the two of them are having a dialogue about contemporary art in the magazine Art and Literature that was published by John Ashbury and others and, and Roger Eager and Monaghan and Anne Dunn in France. Um, Michael Andrews, the thing I like about Kitai, and we're looking at, this is a, this is a late painting, the, the Western Bathers from the mid-90s, uh, you know, combines his passion for John Ford with Cezanne. Uh, but, and this is a, the work we've looked at already earlier, uh, Kent Studas Land from 1962. Uh, so, uh, shoot, sorry, I have to go back. Uh, Michael Andrews, the thing I like about Kitai is he seems to have his own house in order and that the emotion of the pictures is about ideas and things outside himself and not about his frame of mind. Victor Willing. Uh, what I find boring about Kitai is his insistence on lucidity. Perhaps it is to do with your definition of him being an idealist. It makes it impossible for him to produce images that affect one, because all the time he's preparing his own little commentary on what he's doing, so that they're illustrations of ideas. They don't do what you say you hope your paintings do for you, to try to find out what you think. He seems to have made up his mind and illustrated his made up mind in pictures, to which Michael Andrews replies, the kind of image I valued was one that worked musically like a chord, but with Kitai it's more like a xylophone. Instead of a chord, you get a frame with lots of separate notes all moving, all moving along together. I quote that rather than quoting uh, some of the very vituperative criticism that uh, his, his Tate Gallery retrospective Oh, come back. Take Gallery Retro oh. Take Gallery Retrospective um, aroused. Um, so, uh, but much of the Tate Retrospective had to do with, uh, much of the anti-Tate Retrospective criticism had to do with inauthenticity, uh, to do with the elective style. Um, the feeling, therefore, is that the critics completely missed the boat that they were attacking uh, a painter for precisely what made his work potentially very important. Uh, in the Los Angeles paintings, as I mentioned, Sandra Fisher, his wife, tragically dies during the Tate retrospective of an aneurysm. Kitai blames this on the press who had attacked his work and caused misery and tension in his house. Um, he moves to Los Angeles and then produces this body of work, the Los Angeles series, in which uh, his memory of Sandra is transformed into this angel, a play on this, the name of the city, as, as, as he and Sandra, who epitomizes the Shekhinah, the, the Holy Spirit in uh, uh, the, the Kabbalistic conception of the Godhead, um, the, the feminine aspect of God becomes for him, despite his continued agnosticism, becomes for him a kind of, in his 
Jewish question paintings um, synonymous with Sandra. Rather like the old age, this is, this, I call these um, very publicly private pictures. So that he's dealing with a very, very intimate subject, uh, but doing it in work which continues to be exhibited and part of his oeuvre. Almost like the old age style, it's possibly pos pos possible to see this penultimate period in Kitai's work as oxymoronically a kind of willed fainus. He's he's playing the part, if you like, of the the painter Modi, who's so oppressed by the critical misunderstanding of his work and rejection uh, that he's become a little touched and is seeing angels and uh, is lost in a kind of um, personal idyll. Why won't it go forward? <laughs> The title of this work, The Sexist, has nothing to do with our understanding of what a sexist might be, which might indeed be Kitai, but um, uh, he's, <laughs> sorry, cheap jibe, but um, he, he, Kitai had a, this ambition to make paintings um, throughout his career, he had this ambition to make paintings of types and also paintings where, of, 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 type, of, char of characters as well. So both individual characters who could re re uh, move from painting to painting rather in the way that a novelist's characters move in and out of a novel, at the same time also types. So he had cafeists, the orientalist, the uh, diasporist, of course, and um, the sexist is, is 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 a is an image of Sandra, a very uh, erotic, glamorous uh, Venus and furs, if you like. Uh, what's rather poignant, or very poignant, is the way um, there's the, the violin at her feet and those unusual red kickers, which stylist fashion-wise hardly go with her fur coat, um, but uh, actually relates to this very beautiful painting, which we were lucky to have downstairs uh, in our Sandra Fisher show, Max's First Shoes from 1986, one of Sandra's paintings. The whole um, angelology of uh, uh, his Los Angeles paintings coming from the Kabbalah, which he studies via uh, Benjamin's uh, uh, great friend, uh, Gershom Sholem, and his marvelous book, uh, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, and his studies of the Kabbalah, um, puts us in mind of the uh, Angelus Novus, uh, the painting by Paul Clay, uh, watercolor by Paul Clay, that through very rough times in Paris where he couldn't, didn't have enough money to, to eat, Benjamin somehow kept possession of this, uh, this, this drawing of clays, which he'd bought in affluent years in Berlin, and eventually bequeathed to, uh, or left to uh, Sholem, who bequeathed it to the Israel Museum. And uh, rather touchingly, there is uh, Benjamin's Clay Angel 2002 by Kitai. In conclusion, there's this rather, Benjamin probably if his name is, if you ask somebody who hasn't read much Benjamin but just say Benjamin, they might say Aura. Benjamin's best known essay, uh, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproducibility as it's been retranslated rather inelegantly uh, recently, uh, talking about what's in fact a central phenomenon for all artists, this loss of aura that occurs in the age of mass reproduction, where uh, what had been a precious art object in a palace or a museum becomes a ubiquitous image that can be reproduced infinitely. And that how does the, how does the art retain its aura um, subsequently? We won't go into uh, Benjamin's conclusions, but in Kitai, in marked contrast to uh, one, one might think, in contrast, to the and, and less modernist in a way than, than Benjamin and his attitude towards tradition. In, in Kitai, uh, I think we can identify what we could call a lust for aura. 
Um, uh, he's, he's somebody clearly uh, very inclined to hero worship, uh, to the creation of a Parnassus filled with these saints that he calls them, these personages whose, whose lives are exemplary of this attitude that, that he is cultivating for his own work. Um, a romantic sense, if you like, of affiliation or kinship or continuum with figures from the past contrasts with the Benjamin's way of always creating a dialectic when working uh, with historic interests. This is a painting of G. Sholem, 2007. Um, some more saints. Um, Max Lieberman from 2007. Uh, poignantly, uh, a great, revered father figure in German modern art, largely forgotten now. L.W., of course, Wittgenstein. Marcel, young Proust, who we saw on his deathbed, as we saw Degas. Increasingly, this is called K Enters the Castle at Last, 2004, a painting that corrects that agonizing lack of conclusion or lack of fulfillment, one should say, of uh, Kafka's The Castle. Here, K, who of course is Kitai, as well as K, this surveyor, has finally entered the castle to meet a critic in the, f in the form of this speared porcupine type figure. Increasingly, it would seem that Kitai's exemplary diasporist ceases to be Benjamin and becomes Kafka. Of course, it's Kafka as mediated through Benjamin. Um, he's turning to Benjamin, he turns to Kafka, mediated through Benjamin, does the Kabbalah as guided through by Gershom Sholem. Gershom Sholem, who said of Benjamin, his insights are those of a theologian marooned in the realm of the profane. And I leave you with a line on Kafka by Benjamin, which might apply to Benjamin and might apply to that other K. To do justice to the figure of Kafka in its purity and in its peculiar beauty, one should never lose sight of one thing. It is the figure of a failure. Perhaps one might say that once he was sure of ultimate failure, everything on the way to it succeeded for him as if in a dream. Thank you.